The views and comments expressed on The Space Show by its guests, callers, and listeners belong to them. The Space Show and its hosts serve only as a platform and are not responsible for others' comments or views. All topics discussed on The Space Show are primarily for educational purposes. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but we because they are hard. Start. Four, three, two, one. It's The Space Show with Dr. David Livingston. Broadcasting to seven continents. Consistently bringing you quality news and interviews with the best and brightest minds in the new space economy. Here is the founder and host of The Space Show. The man who best articulates the vision of space commercial enterprise. Dr. David Livingston. Good morning, listeners. Welcome to our Friday morning space show program, Friday morning California time, of course. Great to be here, and thanks for tuning in. I am the host, David Livingston, and we have a great program for you this morning. We'll get to it in just a second. Let me uh, run through our announcements. For those of you who would like to call our guest today, our toll-free number is one 866 Six eight seven seven two two three. Remember, there are no call screeners, so be patient. We'll answer the phone and bring you up on air as quickly as possible. We'll also hold you over the break if applicable, and we also answer the phone during the break and put you on hold for when we resume our broadcast after the break. So again, one eight six 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 eight seven seven two two three. And if you want to use email or you're listening at work and can't use the phone. It is Dr. Space at thespaceshow.com. Please do remember that um, we are copyrighted and trademarked, but we do allow you to uh, you know, copy, download, and pass around and share our programs with people you think might be interested in them. So a 90-minute program is roughly 40 megabytes. I use transferbigfiles.com to share them on the Internet because they're too big for email. Uh, But there are a lot of free programs around where you can do something like that. If you have any questions about that, please do email me at drspace at thespaceshow.com. Remember, don't do anything commercial with our programs. No edits, private YouTube channels, private website clips or anything like that. And we don't permit written transcripts, even if they're for your own use. And we appreciate your following these really few guidelines. We do podcasts, and you'll find our RSS URL on our website as well as both of our newsletters, and that's uh, for subscribing to our podcast. And if you uh, want to hear us, uh, you can find us in iTunes, Podcast Alley, AstrospaceNow.com, YAstro.com, and Microsoft Zoom. If you have podcasting questions, please email me at drspace at thespaceshow.com. That is our uh, website address, the space show, space So we have a detailed, comprehensive newsletter on our website. You can't miss it. It's in the upper half of our homepage. And that's uploaded Sunday evening. That website newsletter has all of the details of the week's programming, the guest bio, a future event section for the space show. And then if we have to change our schedule or modify it during the week, we do it on the website newsletter first. So you might want to check it from time to time to stay current. You can also subscribe to our very brief email uh, newsletters, which go out early Monday morning via email. And that is just send me a note at drspace at thespaceshow.com, or you can use the pop-up window on our website. Uh, Remember that everything we do, uh, going back to 2001, is archived and available to all of you free of charge. You can listen right off of our website, or you can easily download the programs. And then we have a store up near the top. Please do check it out, Space Show Gear. And above all, remember that there's a support support the Space Show button on our website. We are a 501c3 nonprofit with OneGiantLeapFoundation.org. We exist because many of you do support us. We thank you for that support. We would not be here. We would not be offering free content were it not for your continued support. So, again, we thank you for that. Hope that you continue. Look for new supporters all the time. And if you have any questions, email me at our email address. Remember, as a nonprofit 501c3, you do get a tax deduction on the federal income tax and the same for California as we are a California 
Public Benefit Corporation. Uh, and that does bring me to our two guests today. So I'm happy to uh, bring back to you uh, Randa and Rod Milliron, and they are the co-founders of Inner Orbital Systems, which is in Mojave, California. So Randa is the CEO, and Rod does the rocket engineering and all sorts of things. Uh, you know, their vials are already up on the website, but Inner Orbital Systems has a website which I think you should go to um, and be applicable during our broadcast today, interorbital, that's one word, dot com, will take you there. And uh, they do a lot of interesting things. They uh, have developed a TubeSat a do-it-yourself kit that anyone other than me can buy it and put it together and figure out how to make it work. I think it's a little too complex for, for me. Uh, and I believe you get a rocket launch with it when they're ready to launch, but we'll get more details about that from both of them in just a minute. And uh, they've had a very successful October uh, engine test. They use hypergolic fuels. We'll talk to them about that. Their bios are up on the website in many places, as they've been frequent guests on the show. Uh, time to talk to them rather than read about them. So, Randa and Rod, welcome back to the program. Congratulations on your engine test late last year, and tell us what's new with Inner Orbital. Oh, great to be here, David. Uh, uh, everything's uh, everything's running smoothly here. Uh, we uh, done uh, uh, actually a uh, completed a major milestone in our program. As you mentioned, we had a successful uh, engine test, and that engine is our main engine. Uh, the way we're running our program. Uh, uh, this particular engine will be uh, uh, bundled uh, with uh, seven others to give us uh, the required thrust to do our first uh, our first orbital launch. Uh, and so, uh, actually, Rod uh, can give you more detail on that. Uh, it's been uh, been an exciting year for us, and we're looking forward to, to much much more adventure. Okay, Rod, Rod, this was a static engine test, right? Yes. Uh, the the, the system that we are developing is a modular system, uh, a multi-stage rocket. Uh, this is a this is a three-stage rocket. She was mentioning a seven-module vehicle, but we can go in any from anywhere from uh, five through. Uh, we have a 36-module vehicle as well uh, that we're developing. But uh, in any case, the same for the booster for the for the first and for for all of the stages. Uh, this this engine is the primary engine. Uh, and it was a very successful test. Now, you have a video of the test on your website, correct? Uh, yeah. If you go to the website, you, you can click on, on, on the uh, photograph, uh, a still photograph of the test, and you can you see a, a, a video image of the engine firing, and it's a pretty exciting engine test I, 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 as far as engine tests go. What is the thrust of this engine? Uh, this engine develops uh, sea level... Uh, thrust of 7,500 pounds, and uh, for uh, the upper stage applications, there, there's a larger expansion ratio, and it develops uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 8,500 pounds of thrust at altitude. And the engine that generates uh, uh, in a vacuum uh, 295 uh, seconds uh, specific impulse. At sea level, it's, it's, it's around 238 seconds. So it's uh, it's 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 a, a, an engine that's that's designed to do the job. And you're using um, special fuels. I, I think you're you're the only guys using hypergolic fuels, correct? Yes, yeah, so we're using storable propellants. Um, we're not using the expensive uh, poisonous propellants. We're using the ones that are actually uh, industri industrial chemicals. Uh, the nitric acid is our white fuming nitric acid is is the oxidizer. Which is uh, commonly available and very inexpensive, very high density, and we're using uh, our f main fuel is uh, primary fuel is uh, turpentine, which is uh, of course uh, a renewable resource, and it's also uh, very very it burns very smoothly with nitric acid. That's why we chose that fuel and the fuel also. And turpentine also has a bit, a little bit higher density than uh, gasoline. Uh, or, or, or or kerosene, so it's uh, it's got it's got a lot of advantages. It burns really smoothly, and it's it's also a little higher density, and the 
and uh, it, it makes it makes the whole process of uh, loading the propellants into the especially in a modular vehicle it simplifies the whole process of loading the propellants because we're not dealing with uh, evaporating cryogenic uh, uh, very cold uh, propellants or, or, or liquid oxygen in the in the best case, so there's no expansion and contraction problems or any problems with valves freezing. So it, it very it simplifies the whole the whole process for this type of a vehicle, and also it's very uh, uh, useful for uh, very uh, applicable for ocean launch, which we are planning on doing. So we don't have any problems with uh, super cold liquids in, in a in a liquid in a uh, high high humidity environment. Did the test perform as expected? Did you? learn some new things where you have to make changes or uh, are you ready to go to the next step and what is the next step? Actually the the, perfor the performance of the engine was uh, exactly what we expected. So, I mean the thrust and the specific impulse and everything else was was uh, according to the, the numbers uh, with the calculations that we did before the when we developed the engine. So it, it's it's there's not much really to do with it. What we're doing now is we're 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 developing the method of it's it's an ablative cooled engine. I should mention it's not regen. It doesn't have a cooling jacket, and it's uh, we have a uh, ablative materials that are uh, we're developing ways of, of mass producing these these engine casings. We call them engine casings. The engine is basically reusable, uh, and the engine casings are kind of are. Kind of like uh, you you plug them in and, and unplug them when when after the engine is fired. They're 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 designed to go for up to four minutes a four minute burn. And once we fire the engine for the for a full full duration, uh, what we have to do is just like a cartridge. We unplug the uh, the, the casing and and uh, and then plug a new one on, and, and on the engine, and we're ready to fire the engine again. So, and what is your next step now? What what what's next in your in your R and D plan and testing? Uh, it, it, we're coming up on another uh, uh, engine test. Uh, it's going to be very. It's, it's coming up in, uh, in, a, in a few weeks, and we have some uh, a lot of software that we developed that automates the entire uh, 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 firing uh, procedure, so that. Uh, we just we just start an ignition an ignition sequence in the engine. Uh, the software takes over and, and fires the engine and and and, there, and reads all of the the any, any of the sensors that are connected to the engine and decides whether or not to continue burning or when something something should something happen the engine will shut down automatically. So we'll be testing that that system. And that's the system that is. Uh, and it was re required for doing uh, when we have multiple modules attached uh, for for a three-stage uh, orbital vehicle. Uh, I should mention that the N7 uh, it's a three-stage. It has uh, four four of the modules uh, make up the first stage. Two are the second stage, and then there's a single module for the third stage. And the and the first stage, well, there there are four of those engines that fire, so it will generate around 30,000 pounds of thrust at sea level. Let me ask you. So, a module is equal to an engine, right? There's, per, per, there's one engine per module. Okay. The module is like an entire. It's like a sounding rocket, basically. It's it's, it's a standalone rocket in and of itself. Uh, so, it, each of those modules has um, has a an engine, a dedicated engine. Uh, so, um, it, it's not just the engine, but it's the whole. Um, it's, it's really the whole uh, single rocket that is joined into the. Uh, Seven module vehicle. So, uh, imagine seven rockets uh, bundled, and uh, that's um, that's the seven module. Uh, well, we're all used seven. to seeing that. Because you're used to seeing strap-ons on uh, on a lot of the uh, right on a lot vehicles. of the. So basically, we're, we're, their whole vehicle is designed on that on that on that very space on that principle, and it's parallel staging as well. Do you do you fire all at once, or is there a sequence of firing that you have to work uh, out? Well, out of the seven on the ground, four of them start up on the ground. That's the first stage, and uh, when when the propellant is depleted, we we drop off those four, uh, and right before that, the other the the two two, two modules uh, start up that make up the second stage, and then when those two uh, uh, when the propellant is depleted on those two modules, uh, the, right right before the the engines are shut down, the third stage uh, engine, which is the single module, ignites, and then then those two are dropped off. 
And this third, uh, this, this third stage single module uh, is what takes the, finally takes the payload uh, into orbit. Now, you mentioned that you could have up to, I think you said, 30 modules? Uh, we have a 36 module that we will be using for the Google Lunar X Prize. It's designed to uh, put uh, a metric ton into, uh, into low Earth orbit uh, and uh, something like uh, 60 kilograms on the surface of the moon. And that one uh, is a three-stage as well. With a four, well, the, there's a, a fourth stage, which is the uh, translunar stage. That takes the payload to the moon, but that, that is was classified as the payload, uh, part of the payload. But that is also three stage with 20, 24 uh, modules uh, making up the, the first stage and uh, eight modules for the second stage and four, four modules or CPMs make up the third stage in, so, in that vehicle. So the, so the fourth stage, which goes to the moon, is broken down into three modules as well. No, that was a single single module. That that is what basically what takes you out of orbit and gets you to escape velocity. Okay, so then, when you're going to the surface of the moon, you have four stages. Well, there's a a lander that's the payload on on the fourth stage. Basically okay. The fourth stage that 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 is accelerated to escape velocity, and then there, as as you approach the moon, that is detached. That has its own uh, uh, propulsion system. Uh, it's basically like a like an old surveyor lander, and, it, and it, that that system takes over, and, and its engines are what are used to uh, to land on, land on the surface of the moon. Uh, here's your first email question from Sarah, who's in Reno, Nevada, and Sarah says, "Is my understanding is that for Google Lunar X Prize, the winning team has to be able to get onto the moon and do whatever they're going to do by the end of 2015. So that's just a little more than two years from now." Are you going to be operational with your rocket and be able to meet that kind of timeline? Well, we're trying. Do, do, do you know if anyone's meeting that timeline yet? So far, I don't uh, know of anybody. Uh, some, some people claim that they have uh, uh, arranged for a launch, but I, I, I don't know if there's, there's, there's no one on a, on a launch manifest. That yeah, I that's what I, I check this from time to time because I'm, I'm kind of skeptical about Google Lunar X Prize, but that's just me. And I don't see that anyone's actually plopped down money and and booked and confirmed on a manifest ride. And most of them are secondary payloads, I guess, right? Well, we're trying. We're going to try to do that. But in any case, we've already uh, committed ourselves to a, a lunar landing you know, outside of the, Go the Google Lunar X Prize. So if that if that still is in effect, then we'll we'll go with that. But in, in any case, we're going anyway. In fact, when we uh, we uh, signed up. Uh, with uh, Synergy Moon, we had a, a, a private uh, lunar sample return mission uh, already uh, already in the works that, that would use the, the Neptune uh, 36. Uh, so uh, that that became the uh, the team's uh, vehicle. So I guess we are the only team with a with a vehicle that is uh, that is being built towards that purpose. And uh, you know, in terms of uh, our our uh, continued work in that area. And you, you launch from the water, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely, after that. Uh, off the Pacific or off the Atlantic? Pacific at this point. Okay. Probably near Hawaii. We've been, uh, we've been looking at uh, uh, using uh, an area in Hawaii as a staging area for our ocean launch. Uh, uh, for equatorial yeah. like, uh, ocean launches. Uh, mm -hmm. that, and for our polar launches, we're, we're going uh, directly south, uh, right off the coast of California, kind of southwest of Los Angeles. But uh, we, uh, uh, we talked about this before, but for those who haven't heard about it, I, people seem to think it's very easy to go to a, a range and, uh, you know, just plunk your rocket down and take off. Well, that, that's not the case. It yeah, hardly. It costs millions <laughs> and millions of dollars, sometimes environmental and impact the, the uh, reports and, and the scheduling issue. You know, it's just it, we, our whole goal was to do a system that would give a launch on demand, that could be like once a week, you know, if people wanted it, if the market demands it, we can theoretically do that uh, with an ocean-going uh, venture. And uh, we could never even think about doing that from a, a land-based spaceport, and that's anywhere in the world. Uh, one of the reasons we're looking at Hawaii is because we have, uh, there are ITAR issues uh, with, um, uh, as, as some agencies uh, refer to it, uh, exporting ICBMs, even if it's to ourselves, you know, <laughs> that's frowned upon apparently. But um, we uh, we are looking at uh, some solutions to that uh, uh, long-term, uh, you know, long-term missions uh, 
the ocean the ocean really offers the, the greatest amount of freedom freedom from again from the high cost of the spaceports and uh, for scheduling and for re- uh, getting around the regulations export regulations yeah not in the, well not necessarily getting around them but actually not having to well, deal yeah, with them well, yeah not yeah, with yeah them. I guess that, that, that we are compliant let's put it that way well but, you, you know yeah, yeah, it's, it's um it's a it's something it, that took uh, years to uh, to actually realize, and after many years of investigating, literally every spaceport in the world, uh, that's the conclusion we came to. That's the only way for us to do a low cost program is to eliminate those uh, this uh, exorbitant uh, spaceport fees. Um, you have another uh, email question uh, from Tim is in Huntsville, uh, and he's at work and he can't use the phone. So he says, in an earlier space show program, Dr. Jim Wirtz of Microcosm talked about cutting the cost of space access in areas besides launch vehicle design, such as, for example, ground station and launch operations. What steps are you taking to cut cost apart from cost savings in the design of your Neptune launch vehicle? Also, have you considered raising revenue by breaking into the sounding rocket market? Well, that's interesting. Uh uh, as, as we mentioned, we are we we did design the vehicle to be launched from either land or sea, and, and now it's you know going to be probably 90 percent from the ocean, and that's a massive cost savings, as, as I just explained. Uh, we also designed the vehicle to use storable propellants, so we don't have to have this massively expensive uh, cryogenic infrastructure to uh, you know to uh, support uh, that type of propellant. Uh, we, uh, well, and uh, yeah. I should mention, as far as sounding rockets, a single CPM, a common propulsion module, uh, can be used as a sounding rocket. And actually, we're going to be launching one to a space altitude uh, in, the, in, the, in, in, in future. So, uh, and there are people expressing an interest in, 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 a, in having a sounding, having small payloads launched on suborbital missions. And uh, if we if the customer wants wants it, we'll do it. We actually that that actually that launch is for sale currently. That's going to happen sometime this summer. It looks like it's a, it can be 145 kilos to an altitude of 310 kilometers and a ballistic trajectory, or or a bigger or smaller, you know, depending and to a higher altitude. But that's the kind of the baseline. It's called the SR145, and it's a it's a single full performance. Uh, uh, Common propulsion module or CPM, as we but in terms it. of a customer base, there are more people interested in having a satellite launched into orbit than having a small payloads launched on suborbital trajectories. Uh, that that's we, what we've discovered through the years. So uh, there, there's 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 only, there's only a little a small amount of business in the suborbital world, mm-hmm. and that's, comparatively. Yeah. And that's that's the consensus of a number of uh, rocket developers. Th- those who started at the same time as we did uh, uh, explored that. You know that that realm. I mean, it, this is something that can be done, uh, you know, uh, actually fairly inexpensively, but um, there just there just wasn't a market for it at the time. And uh, you know, there was, I guess, people were content to pay the uh, you know tens of millions of dollars for a black brand launch. But uh, here's a vehicle that can replace that and do it for, you know, well under well under half a million dollars. You know, to take a really massive payload, maybe 12 minutes of microgravity, you know, really, really a you know, good substantial type of rocket that's very inexpensive and can be launched on demand. So um, it, when would you actually be able to schedule a te- demo flight or a test flight? Well, we're doing our... our uh, well, we're we're, yep. we're we're coming up on it, but we don't yep. want it, we don't we're like everybody else out there. We're not going to give dates anymore because uh, yeah, it just gets you in trouble giving a date. <laughs> you know how it, that it's is. It's upcoming. We're we're telling you it's yep. upcoming, and we'll, we'll, when we know for sure when it's happening, then we'll we'll announce it. Actually, you'll be the first to know, David. We'll send well, you no, I I would be the third to know because the two of you would know before <laughs> I know, right? Okay. But uh, this it's it's imminent. Let's put it that way. And we have uh, uh, there's you know if you don't if it's not ready, you can't launch it. You know, and that's that's the basic truth of this. Just ask. Uh, Anybody around, like Branson, is he launching that? No, but he wanted to many, many years ago, just like we wanted to many, many years ago. Uh, it, it's, it's, we're developing a new vehicle, and, and you, just, you just cannot estimate how long it will take. Um, but how many test flights, if, if you really are in a position to make the uh, Google Lunar X Prize contest, for example, how many test flights would be necessary to um, 
declare operational and and make that flight and how do you get the funding for a Tesla? I can imagine that they're pretty expensive. Well, our, our, our orbital missions, our satellite missions, are essentially our test flights for the lunar, la- lunar launcher. Um, the, uh, and, and the Google Lunar X Prize attempt will be the first launch of that vehicle to the moon. So, uh, you know, that it's, um, it's not something that, uh, that, one, we can afford to do over and over again. And you don't want to waste the test launch. You might as well just go for it. And if we have good performance on all the uh, first on these uh, suborbital test flights that are coming up, um, and then we move to the orbital flights, and if those are doing well with, the, you know, with this, this whole system, I don't see why not to, you know, to also to make the deadline of the Google Lunar X Prize to get in under that window. I believe the test flight of the N36 is going to be our lunar attempt. We have to also, I uh, should repeat it again, uh, for those who are not aware, the, the common propulsion module is, is, the, is the simplest form of a rocket that, 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 any, uh, that you can build. I mean, it doesn't have a turbo pump. It's pressure-fed, but it's blow-down. There's uh, no separate pressuring system. Uh, it's bladedly cooled. Uh, and and all, all of these elements and, um, have, are, have led to a, a very extremely reliable system. I mean, it's, the chances of uh, failure are, are, are radically reduced with this type of design. So we're, we're pretty confident that uh, once we are, uh, have this whole system up and running, that uh, that we can start adding other more modules and, and have a successful launch. Um, here's another uh, email question. It's a slightly different subject, and this is from Paul, and he's in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and he says, David, I'm at work, so email. Uh, please ask your guests for an update on the Olaf Zipser jump, and did the Red Bull success alter your plans for that jump? Uh, no, it has not altered it at all. And it is, in fact, as, as Olaf says, uh, you know, the uh, a, a balloon can never go higher than a rocket. <laughs> so uh, Olaf's first attempt will likely break uh, uh, Baumgartner's record. And uh, we, we mentioned that he's He's planning to do uh, a, a whole series of uh, jumps at increasing al- from increasing altitudes until he gets to an orbital jump. But this is all uh, this is all a part of a um, development of an orbital rescue suit, and he's working with Zvezda uh, uh, on this. He's been back and forth to Russia for both training and uh, and uh, collaboration in, in uh, developing this rescue system. Uh, which is, as we all know, is sorely needed if uh, if space tourism is to actually, you know, uh, take off literally, and um, and provide you know viable um, viable survivability in case there's a problem with the uh, the rocket. You know, you don't just uh, <laughs> give up at that point. You want to have a uh, well, as, as Olaf puts it, you want to be able to to return to Earth safely and and have an enjoyable experience on the way. So um, this is something he's working on. He just completed his. 21,000th uh, skydive in Dubai uh, a few weeks ago. So uh, he's, he's, he's working on it, and uh, we're working with him. And uh, you know, as far as we're concerned, it's a go. We simply don't know the exact date of that, but it will be on one of the single module rockets, very likely. 21,000 skydives? Yes. How old is the guy? Well, he's he's uh, he's over forty. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, but uh, I mean, that's a lot of jumps. It, it really is. I mean, I, and he I know. That, well, he's an instructor, and he he invented the uh, the free fly method. I think Baumgartner used some of that in order to stabilize himself when he went into that spin. But um, he uh, he does um, he does have a school in uh, uh, in Venezuela, and I think he has one in uh, in Italy, if I'm not mistaken. But he he um, he's at it every day, you know. And uh, I think he I, I can't say, but I'm sure he's he may be the he may hold the record for the for uh, you know the highest amount of dives. I don't know, but if if he doesn't, he's up there in the in that upper echelon of, of folks. So, so that's that still part. being planned. There. Yes. That's, okay. That's, uh, again, uh, we have a multitude of uh, of programs going here, and and um, he's currently seeking funding on that, and I. Uh, I think it would be a fantastic well, advertising effort. To, you know, if somebody wanted to slap their logo on that, it would be, you know, be a hell of a, hell of a 
advertising campaign. Okay, here's another one for you. I guess it's going to be Email City because everyone's at work. This is Wes in Tampa, Florida. Would a suborbital flight offer a space view for sensor testing? Is the payload retrievable, which would help test low-grav manufacturing 3D printing? Um, if, if the uh, payload has a recovery system, certainly it is retrievable. Um, it depends on, on how the payload is designed. I, mean, the, the, that, I guess that would be up to the, per, the, the one who provides the payload. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're looking now, at... We could, uh, we could provide a recovery system yeah. uh, for, uh, for any payload as far as that goes, but... We're looking the at making yes this. All of above, yeah. and, and we're looking at this, this rockets will very likely be expendable because they're so inexpensive. Uh, and we think that it would pick it out at altitude and recover by parachute. We think that's a you know that's a viable uh, way to do it. It's uh, and again, if we're doing a sea launch, uh, we don't know that it would even be uh, uh, you know um, cost effective to try to retrieve a, a vehicle like that. So we think a parachute recovered payload would uh, would work best, maybe fly back. And also if a thing. customer would like to have their payload launched from a land port, we can, uh, that, that can be arranged as well. So he's white talking. He, he, and we're looking at white sands as a possible or whatever, so. uh, yeah, wallops and white sands at the moment for uh, potential ground launch uh, capabilities and uh, opportunities for those who need it. So he, he's talking about suborbital and sensor testing uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong I don't I'm not I'm uh, not aware that you're actually doing suborbital are you well these first tests that we're doing are suborbital okay the module yeah. uh, is a suborbital launch because it doesn't it can't reach a, a single a single stage can't go to uh, orbital velocity so we have for these we can use a single uh, common propulsion module and launch a payload on a suborbital uh, sounding rocket kind of flight and it will go to an extremely high altitude, and in this case, uh, it, it will go to, depending on the weight of the payload, somewhere between 310 and 550 uh, you know, uh, kilometers at this point. We're looking at the uh, apogee to be uh, you know, that extreme. But uh, that would definitely allow you to uh, space test equipment. And uh, you know, we have, um, in fact, on our first two low-altitude launches that we'll be conducting north of uh, Mojave, the Pacific Rocket uh, society test area up at Cone Dry Lake. Um, you know, we have four uh, payloads on on each of those flights. There are two flights scheduled uh, for that. So uh, uh, we've already sold uh, yes. payload yes. space. As soon as we uh, complete this uh, next uh, engine test, uh, we're going to uh, put an engine on the rocket, which is already built, and we're going to do that low altitude uh, 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 test launch. From Cone Dry Lake, that's, we, that's uh, upcoming. Yeah, we have uh, Moorhead State has a, a payload on that. Uh, Naval Postgraduate School, King Abdullah University, and uh, there's an additional might be a Synergy Moon payload on there as well. Um, <clears throat> so, um, if if I you were to rate uh, zero to ten, with ten being the best, would you rate your progress and and the direction you're going and the speed and all of that at a ten, or how would you rate uh, how you've been doing over the last year or two? Well, I'd say the progress is a ten, but you know we're, we're we could be going faster. I mean, we we had if we had more, uh, we, we 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 could always use more funding, but I don't know how what, what kind of a number to apply to the rate of progress, but. But we're, we're, everything is, is is going along as planned. Yeah, technologically. Technologically, but we would like it. Would like to start moving faster. Have you thought of doing a Kickstarter campaign? Um, I don't. We, we're actually we're actually making enough enough money through our satellite sales to fund the uh, the um, uh, launch and the flight test programs for these first uh, low altitude flights. And we have a number of other potential revenue streams uh, emerging. One is for an advertising campaign using uh, using the high-performance uh, launcher. And uh, we've had a couple of inquiries about that, so we'll, we'll see if that works out. We, we did also complete a NASA SBIR uh, for, the, um, uh, for the further development of our uh, you know, nano launcher here, and uh, that was very helpful, and uh, uh, we enjoyed doing that. Uh, so there, there's been money coming in from a variety of sources, and again, you know, I, I should stress that uh, even those with unlimited funds, say Virgin Galactic and, and others that are that are um, you know really run by uh, uh, well-heeled individuals or groups, uh, no, that's 
just pouring money on it doesn't mean you're going to get it done any faster. Yeah, I, I think that the progress that we're making for the amount of uh, funding that we have, I think, is, is, is I mean, it's, it's, it's going really fast by comparison to some of the other companies out there. Uh, you guys have a caller, and remember, I don't screen the calls, so... Okay, well, uh, we'll, we'll tell you if you need to cut it off or not. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we, we're rolling the dice. Okay, uh, no good, problem. Good morning, uh, caller. Who are you, and where are you, please? Hello, uh, my name is Wes. I'm uh, Wes from Tampa. Okay, well, we just asked your question. Did you hear it? Yeah, yes, I did. Oh, yes, that I did. And, uh, yes. I did, and I had a little more detail and uh, was able to sneak away, so it's not email city all day for you. Uh, so do you have something more for uh, for our guest? Yeah, yeah so um, is it my understanding then that for the suborbital flights that you intend to release the payload, you know, have your rocket actually let go of the payload, have the payload fly free, um, although albeit on a ballistic trajectory coming back. That's a possibility. That's if if it's required. You know, unless you can uh, you know stream your your data, and and use that as your experiment. You know, re- re- recovering that uh, that data stream. If that's sufficient for your your experiment, then great. But if if you need to have it returned, uh, we're we're looking at. Uh, you know, as we mentioned, potentially having a parachute return on on uh, maybe an encapsulation uh, uh, device for that uh, for that um, experiment. Okay, very cool. So that would be a good vehicle if I wanted to say do a pre-orbit flight on my ion engine. So oh yes, yes. And is this is this Wes Salix? Yes, it is. Hi, Randa. <laughs> hi, hi. Hey, Wes is one of our uh, our TubeSat builders. And uh, and uh, this is this is great. We just saw an article on him yesterday, and he was at the Maker Fair. Uh, yeah. Is that in Florida? Long time caller, long time fan. <laughs> oh, great. Thanks. Have you built the tube set yet, Wes? We're about halfway through the build. Um, honestly, we uh, we start building the boards, and then we uh, we start dreaming, and uh, that slows us down on the build process. So we have to keep coming back to uh, you know ground reality and uh, solder another thing on. How hard is it? Is it user friendly, or do you have to have some real background to do it? I think it's actually fairly user friendly. Uh, it, it's definitely not as simple as you know a paint by numbers kit. You, you've got to you've got to source some parts on your own. You've got to be a little creative. You've got to have some engineering discipline in terms of uh, keeping track of versions of files and boards. And uh, you know you've got to have your wits about you, but uh, you definitely don't need to have built the satellite before or anything close to it in order to be successful with it. Okay. Yeah, and that's uh, the, you, know, you. You were using it for an ion engine, were you not? You're testing that. Uh, is that yeah. happening? Is that yes, the, the current? Um, and that's uh, that's particularly exciting because uh, NASA just put out a, a game changing um, game changer proposal. They're looking for looking for people with game-changing ion engine technology. Huh. Really small mass, uh, perfect for the sizes you're launching. That just came out the other day. Well, wow, that's great. We should perhaps uh, pursue that. Oh yeah, it's on my agenda. But uh, I, 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 I'm thinking things like that are going to real make a real uptick in the, the small satellite market you're serving. Oh, uh, that's fantastic. And and actually, uh, uh, now Wes. Wes um, uh, you're working, and Wes is working with a Google Lunar X Prize team as well. Yeah. Uh, yes, we are. We are hated competitors, right? Yes, we hate each other. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but it's uh, it's it's actually we'll be we'll be flying uh, that technology on um, on one of our uh, on one of our first flights. So uh, that's uh, you know that in itself. I mean, how many times uh, you know can uh, ha- have you have well, have any of us thought, you know, in the, in the even maybe ten years ago, that we would be able to test an, our own ion engine on our own personal satellite? You know, I mean, when well, did we ever think that would reach. be a possibility? Completely out of reach. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, we we look at ourselves here as enablers for that kind of, you know, that kind of as, as Wes said, dreaming. <laughs> but you know, that dreaming becomes, you know, some hardware somewhere down the line. And uh, you know, if we didn't dream. We wouldn't be where we are now. We wouldn't have the hardware ready to go. So uh, sure. you know, that's important, and I, I love the way, uh, you know, just you know, just from the, the variety of of um, payloads that we've we've uh, 
amassed here, like some 47 of them at this point. They're, they're all radically different. They're all uh, imaginative, and, and uh, it's, it's science or art or experimentation that, that just wouldn't have happened without the advent of a dedicated small fat launcher. And our kids. There's, there's been a lot of collaboration. For instance, like the, uh, you're launching one or two satellites for the Naval Postgraduate School, right? And there are three right now that are on, on board for three that. Notes. That's fantastic. And also a, a suborbital payload for them as well. And uh, there are, uh, as, as um, you may know, there, there's Project Calliope, which is a space music project that Sandy Antunes is doing. There's, uh, there's a micrometeoroid study by a, an elementary school group from Puerto Rico. There's a Brazilian STEM group uh, with, a, I think, about 100 uh, 11-year-olds involved in that with their space agency. So there are people who are learning all the skills to do actual space research and make real spacecraft, you know, and, and uh, you know, I would I would have killed for that if I was in elementary school and had the chance of, <laughs> of uh, you know, like working on a real satellite project. I mean, that's just completely amazing to me. And uh, uh, the fact that it's available and the fact that we're helping make that happen is, you know, completely gratifying. We we love it. Oh, we're, I'm happy you're doing it. <laughs> you know, have you seen us that uh, the Navy postgraduate school has got a lot of uh, thesis work coming out about their satellite, mm-hmm. and it's been great design notes for the rest of us builders. That's wonderful. That you know, I've noticed that there's a there's a, a wonderful willingness to share uh, um, um, innovations and uh, and um, you know the, all all. All along the line here, you know, uh, in fact, from the earth, that, that we, we also have a, a TubeSat forum that's run uh, by the designer of the uh, PCBs, the uh, uh, printed circuit boards. And uh, that has been a, a, a wealth of, uh, of information and, uh, and collaboration. Now, you would know better than that, if, better than I would, Wes, because I, I watch it from the outside, but you guys are working you know, with each other. Why is it? It's been, it's been very helpful. You know, there's a. Uh... There's a lot of tricks to the wiring. You asked about the complication of the kit. Mm-hmm. There, are, there, are, there are some connections because the, the kit is actually, in some ways, a collection of other kits that are mm-hmm. out there, like especially for the, on the amateur radio side. Yes. And mm-hmm. those, are, those have interface quirks, like you have to invert the RS-232 pin mm-hmm. for one chip but not for another. You know, just little interface quirks like that mm-hmm. that uh, people need to be reminded of and talked through. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you a question. Why is the Navy postgraduate school launching anything? I don't get the connection there. Oh, they have a great space department there. They're 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 the uh, you know, they're they're developing the new the new space science that'll be used. And 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 actually, all across the military, there's a move to using the small satellites, CubeSats, TubeSats, whatever. Uh, you know whatever is out there, and there's some incredibly advanced work being done in, uh, uh, well, it's um, uh, testing like uh, swarm algorithms, uh, using these as constellations, uh, potentially using them as uh, refueling or for a variety of other reasons of uh, proximity work with larger satellites. Uh, it, it's just it's a burgeoning field. It's it's just. It's exploding. This is in Mon- That's one of the specializations they have at that at the, at the school. Mm-hmm. This is in Monterey, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know that they were. I, I know their language school and their and uh-huh. their political science and and that side of it. I did not know they were. Yeah, very doing very this uh, very high level stuff. And Dr. Bordetsky is the is the head of the program that uh, we're involved with there. And uh, you know these will be used as for them. I think the main the main purpose was to use them as ad hoc. Uh, uh, communication nodes on on orbit. These uh, and these will eventually be used in an actual. Uh, when they're launched, uh, uh, there'll be a ground, uh, uh, some ground activity, uh, probably a worldwide kind of a exercise that uh, we hope to be a part of, and using that as a you know, that node as a, as, a, as part of the activity. So uh, it, it's exciting stuff. I mean, it's like I said, it's it's all levels. It's from elementary school up to the the highest, uh, the highest level of uh, military space research. Guys, I got a really hard, challenging email for you that, that okay. may actually pee you off, but I'll go ahead and ask it. Can take it. And Wes, since you're a customer, 
uh, you might want to opine on on this email as well. So this is from a chap named Blair, and mm -hmm. I, I don't know where Blair is located, but he says, to the best of my research capabilities, interorbital has yet to successfully launch a rocket to space or anywhere as close to it. I'm wondering how you continuously pass due diligence from customers in buying your kits and other products when, in fact, you don't have a successful launch track record. Can you explain that? Well, we have a successful launch track record in our sounding rockets, in our neutrino rocket program, which is a small-scale version of these larger vehicles. Uh, everybody has to have a first time in, a, in an orbital attempt if they're a, you know, a real rocket company, and ours is coming up. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that our, our, um, our costs are, are low for these first two flights. The first two orbital flights are it's for $8,000. You get a launch and a kit if you're an academic uh, uh, institution or, uh, or a nonprofit uh, or an individual working, uh, you know, working on a, on, a, on a program. So you get the kit and your launch yeah. for 8 k Yes. Does anyone ask you uh, for your track record or how they know you'll well, we actually do them, a launch? We show them uh, the, the neutrino launch is, on, it's online. It's, I, I don't know exactly where it is, but you can, you can find it. Look for neutrino sounding rocket in our orbital systems, and you'll see the, uh, we have one video up. For that and we started launching in like 1999. Well, there's all uh, you can yeah. also say that before SpaceX uh, successfully launched something into orbit, they hadn't launched anything either. So yeah. you have to not even a sounding have, rocket. <laughs> not even a sounding rocket. So you got to we we have to believe that, that the technology that we're developing and the testing and how that the successes of those tests will will will, will uh, inevitably lead to a successful launch, uh, whether it's uh, suborbital or into orbital or lunar lunar uh, space. Does it deter customers um, or, or? No, not at all. It's that they ask the question, we give them the answer. We, you don't, that's not something you can, you can pretend, you know, that you've done. It's, uh, you know, this is, a, this is the first, it'll, it'll be the maiden flight of the, of the Neptune 7, this, you know, and then that is carrying, up, it is carrying 24, uh, uh, 24 uh, satellites. And the second will carry 24 satellites, and we're just about sold out on, I, I guess on the they, second. I they get asked that question with a lot of these uh, suborbital companies that are you know, planning to launch people into suborbital space. They've never done it either, but apparently people are buying tickets on these flights. Yeah, they are they 200 grand. Because you, they have, you, you have faith in the technology that's, that's being developed that leads up to the actual you know, final mission. Uh, Wes, you were a customer. Wes, you're a, a customer. Did you question about their their track record their ability to do this how does this enter into you as a customer well i looked at uh I, of course you want to look at their track record uh you always prefer the cheapest product from somebody who's done it a million times before but that's not available yeah it doesn't exist so you know i trust my process as a, as a dreamer and as a, as, a, as a maker and creator i trust my process will get me somewhere and part of that is I have to trust in their process to get somewhere. So, you know, I talked with them. I looked at their, I looked at, you know, their website, had a few emails. Um, and I just, I, did, I got a good vibe that they're on the right, the right track. You know, they're thinking about things. They're, they're dreamers. Um, but they're also doing something about their dream. That, that just talking about it's not enough. And then I even got fortunate enough to go out and, and look at their factory here a year or so ago. And uh, there are some good things. I'm even more confident than ever. So it comes down to a trust in the process, the, the creative process. Um, it's, I, tell, I tell people at Dice Maker Fair, yes, there's still an act of faith. Um, that's sort of unavoidable for anything that's the first time. But uh, it's my first satellite, too. So there's, there's an inherent act of faith in there. Okay. Uh, anything else, Wes? Uh, now I'm free the line if others want to call. Nope, that's it. Thanks for having me on, and it was good talking to you guys. Thanks um, for calling. Thank you very Thanks, much. Um, we're at the halfway point, so let's uh, take our three-minute break, and we'll come back. Does that work for you guys? Yeah. Okay. Everybody stay right where you are, and we'll be back with Randa and Rod and Inner Orbital in about three minutes. Don't go anywhere. The Space Show thanks its listeners for their generous support. 
The Space Show now joins forces with the One Giant Leap Foundation to further advance space education and the establishment of a spacefaring society and culture in America and the world. One Giant Leap Foundation is a tax-exempt organization with the purpose of advancing space education and development along with the Space Show. Your support of the Space Show and One Giant Leap Foundation helps get the word out as to why space is so essential and important to us all. So join with us by going to www.thespaceshow.com and clicking on the Support the Space Show button. Your contribution will help the Space Show and One Giant Leap Foundation in continuing its work and bringing you the programming you want free of charge on a continued basis. And remember, your gift to the Space Show is tax deductible. I'm Dr. David Livingston, creator and host of the Space Show, and I would like to share my vision with you for not only this radio program, but for space development. Space should be like any other place we choose to visit, work in, or call our home. It should be just another destination, like Tahiti, Hawaii, or any place available to us right now on Earth. When this vision becomes reality, we will be spacefaring in our culture, our economy, our society, and in our lives. Our world will be vastly improved by countless space-related benefits, transforming our lives both in space and right here on Earth. And the Space Show is helping to make this vision a global reality. And welcome back, everybody. You're listening to our Friday morning California time space show program, and I'm your host, David Livingston. Our guest today, uh, Interorbital Systems, actually the guests are the people behind Interorbital Systems. I've, I've yet to have a corporation as a guest. Uh, this is Randa and Rod Milliron. Uh, guys, what are the regulations in doing a, a static engine test over at Mojave? Do you have to do a lot of red tape, or, or how does that work at Mojave? It's actually, it's actually fairly straightforward. Uh, we, we have uh, two, two rocket engine test sites here at the, at the spaceport uh, that we built in uh, uh, 1996, and we've upgraded uh, a number of times. So we now have a horizontal test stand and a vertical test stand and an underground blockhouse. So you have an underground blockhouse? Yes, yeah, which we built. You guys, little it, hand. is it only for interorbital, or can anyone uh, no, use it? No, it's, it's, uh, it's only for interorbital. It's for us, but, um, you know, we would consider uh, testing for other people. And, you know, that's, that's y- possible. You actually have an underground bunk- yes, bunkhouse. we do. You do. And, and for a while, I was writing a little blog called uh, The View from the Blockhouse, which I may start again. Yeah, uh, it has a, little, a, part of, a section of it extends above the ground, and, uh, and we have a viewport so we can view out uh, right at ground level, or eyes are actually at ground level. And it's up kind of up on a little hill, and you can look down over at the test site. So it was designed, you know, to be safe in case no matter what happens, we're safe inside of this blockhouse. How deep is it in the ground? Oh, is it twelve feet? Twelve feet down, and we have a. There's about, I guess, a, uh, maybe two feet above ground with the, you know, like bulletproof windows, that sort of thing. People people tend to underestimate the danger of of uh, you know testing this kind of technology and kind of, I, I guess turned a blind eye to it, it's, uh, you, just, you have to be prepared for every type of disaster, no matter, uh, uh, you know, um, what kind of testing you're doing, as long, if you're using uh, pressure vessels or, or, or propellants, you know, uh, that, uh, that ignite, <laughs> Any, anything uh, along those lines, you should really just take every possible precaution. And I, no. I think we're the only... We're we the only no, no, no. Actually, actually, Virgin Galactic just built a blockhouse for themselves. But I think before that, it was... Uh, I think we were the only how, ones... How far there. from your test site are you in the blockhouse? Uh, we're about uh, 350 feet. So you're a football field away. Yeah. And we have data lines that come into the blockhouse. We have, uh, you know, we, we do the remote control. That the, Actually, the engine firing is done... Uh, with a laptop, and, and the launch will be conducted that way as well. So, you know, it's kind of a, it's pretty Spartan, it's pretty stripped pretty, it's, down. It's, it's, it's very automated, the whole, the whole yeah. uh, firing system. So firing what, do you, system. what do you have to do with, uh, with the Mojave Spaceport to get permission to do this? Well, we have, uh, there, there are, uh, ideally you have, uh, you know, to make it, I guess, the least expensive, you would do it during regular business hours so that you could have the uh, airport fire department 
on standby, which is a requirement. And um, uh, they've just now uh, set up a, a website uh, for uh, test site deconfliction because there are now, uh, I don't know how many test sites, maybe somewhere between 13 and 17 test sites uh, uh, run by various companies. And uh, sometimes, you know, people are doing very, very big tests that could impact literally, you know, your, your site. Uh, so the scheduling is done through uh, their announcements made and... Uh, you know, people who are in neighboring sites are, are uh, you know, uh, really given the heads up on, you know, what's, what's going down in terms of, uh, of testing in the neighborhood. So that's actually going to really help, uh, help with scheduling. And, um, we, also, uh, we also block off the road yeah. that goes by the test site. Uh, when, when, and and that's now, we have to announce that. So there, there's another way to get around to, get, you know, to the point that's on the other side of the road that passes by our test site that, we have to announce that. We have to make sure that there's no one uh, in, in, the, in the vicinity during the test. Because mm-hmm. you're dealing with massive forces here. You know, in a lot of cases, uh, well, our, our propellants won't, won't detonate, but they could go up in a fireball. You know? uh, but other propellants that are used at the spaceport can detonate and have detonated and you know, cause you know, death and destruction. So you have to be prepared for uh, every worst-case scenario. You plan it out. You uh, stop traffic... Uh, um, that, with the help of the security here at the airport. There's any possibility of generating what's called cryogel, which is liquid oxygen and kerosene mixed together. That, that could lead to a high-order detonation. Yeah, we don't, we don't have deal, to deal with that, with that with but uh, some people use those propellants. So these are things you, you plan for. You, you, there, there are detonation uh, zones. You can't be inside that zone if you're an observer. Uh, there are uh, all sorts of, um, you know, uh, well, state and federal uh, um, Regulations uh, governing the type of uh, we work that we all a, do here. We also have an EPA permit. Yeah, we, we for operate our with that as well at the test yeah. site. That's an environmental health permit from the county. There are, um, uh, you know, in our case, we don't we don't launch here because we do vertical launch, uh, and um, we launch north of here, as I mentioned before, near Cone Dry Lake. But for that, uh, that's where the the regulatory issues come in from the FAA, we have to have a special permit. It's called a Class Three uh, rocket waiver for these uh, suborbital tests that we'll be doing there because it's uh, the size and the impulse of the, the rocket uh, require that. That's kind, of, um, that's kind of a step towards a license, which is a you know, full-blown license, which we will need for uh, the high-altitude uh, suborbital test we were talking about. Now, obviously, for all the orbital t- uh, uh, launches. Um, so there are there's, um, and that's done through the, um, the uh, FAA and their, their uh, Office of Commercial Space Transportation, uh, the AST. And we held, held one of the first uh, uh, commercial launch licenses ever issued, and that was in, from October of 2000 uh, for a high-altitude ocean-based uh, sounding rocket launch to 120 miles with a, a vehicle we were working on then called the Tachyon, which was also a modular vehicle. But... Um, uh, it's, it, there's a lot of regulation involved, but it's all doable. In, in terms of our satellites, uh, they're considered uh, munitions, surprisingly, and uh, we need to have an export license for each of those. So we work through all the ITAR issues, make sure that you know, we're sending it to a, you know, a safe set of people when we do send one out, and uh, the State Department grants us a license after we go through a number of... But, uh, but that, would only be if, that would only be if you're sending it to an, a foreign... Right. Cert- Right. We have a lot of customers yeah. we have are, are in foreign countries. And we have to make sure that they're in, in countries that are that we can legally mm-hmm. sell to. So, you, so you go through ITAR with yeah. your. Yes, we're we have we're listed as a defense article manufacturer, so we we are registered in that, and um, you know because of the the work we do in the rocket propulsion, but also the uh, the spacecraft. Now that the laws are apparently changing on the spacecraft that may go over to commerce, but. Uh, don't know if that will be happening soon or not. I just, just sent out. I'm sending out one to Brazil uh, this week, and we um, we needed a, we needed our license still. So um, you know that's um, uh, it's just it's just the way business is done. But um, as far as our rockets, go, I, I'm sorry, as our um, satellites go, maybe I should mention that uh, uh, you know we we do launch both the CubeSat form factor and the TubeSat, which is a cylindrical form factor on the same launch vehicle. We've developed a uh, deployment system, which is 
it's different from the P pod, and it's the each each satellite has its own uh, payload bay, essentially, and they're all treated as primary payloads. And there's a secondary. pneumatic release system instead of yeah. a spring release system that the P pod has. Yeah, so um, you know, it's a different different kind of a deal. But but our our builders of of the various kits and uh, the uh, and those who have done their own uh, satellites come from all over the world. I mean, it's literally all over the world. We have 15 different countries represented uh, on the uh, the first two two launches. And those are Vietnam, uh, Singapore. I'm just looking down. You can look at the launch manifest on our on our page. And uh, a number of domestic groups, but uh, Canada, Denmark, I'm just looking at these, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Pakistan, Taiwan, Australia, oh, uh, Croatia, that's part of the Synergy Moon team, and um, Austria, Brazil, many from Brazil. It's, the TubeSats have taken off in Brazil like crazy. I think we have like eight of them out there right now. Mexico, Spain, uh, Chile, and, uh, oh, a really interesting one. We just... We just sold a, a, a TubeSat kit to a, to a group in uh, in Colorado, and it's it's particularly interesting. It's a it's a youth youth group, a 4-H group, that is going to be using their kit in a STEM program. And uh, this is the uh, if, if they're they're on the the borders of uh, Utah and Colorado. I think there are 75. Uh, uh, the youth Indians uh, involved in this, and it's um, again it's run through the 4-H, uh, an extension of the University of Colorado. And they're going to be doing uh, hands-on experimental learning, you know, which we're great proponents of. We you know, we're we're both academics here, and so are many of the people who work here. But the um, you know that whole that whole uh, outreach I think is fantastic because they'll be doing. Uh, different types of, um, uh, well, ex- at least examining different types of experiments that you do in space, like botany, crystal growing, uh, getting rid of space junk, remote sensing, those sorts of things. And then they'll know how to uh, build a satellite and learn the concepts involved in in, uh, in that whole process and learn what it means to collect data or launch a rocket. So this is reaching a group who would traditionally probably not, uh, not even, you know, Dream of, of doing a well. I on. I remember 4-H as being farming and agricultural and, and kind of ranching. So um, yeah, but if you look at how space is used in those, uh, uh, well, those yeah, today, now. yeah, well, especially GPS, for yeah. example, and and weather stuff and things mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, yeah. So that's, uh, that's also just looking at like the levels of fuel in a generator that's running something out on the field out <laughs> in some remote area. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all, all the uh, you know the practical applications of uh, of space is is uh, you know it, it's really becoming a pervasive uh, influence in the whole agricultural uh, you know, arena. But this uh, this in this case this is uh, this is a, an active STEM program. This is a program that I think is bringing people into uh, into a situation uh, again that they probably wouldn't uh, have. Uh, been able to encounter in you know in a remote rural area. So I think it's fantastic that this group has uh, uh, gotten together with a, it's the El Pomar Foundation who are funding it, and um, that is uh, uh, it, to me it's a, it's just a, it's just exciting that this is happening. I find it uh, kind of really, really thrilling. Um, I uh, at last uh, summer small sat. Mm-hmm. Um, Dr. Jurist and I finally got to meet and talk with uh, Bob Twiggs, of course, who you know. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, who, who's, I, I don't know if he's the father of the CubeSat or... But, I would say so, yeah. Uh, and and he's over at Moorhead State, I guess, now, right? Um, and uh, he was telling us he he's bought one of your kits for, for his class because... Yes. Um, <clears throat> he said it's important for... I remember him talking about it. He said it's really important for the students in the class to know that there's actually an outcome for what they're working on. And one way to do that is to, you know, buy a launch, which comes with the kit that the class is working on. Yes. So he, he feels very definite that students 
do a lot better in in outreach and all of their programs if if they know that there's an outcome for them. Well, but I, it reminds me also of the fact that uh, there we we have a, some builders who are a uh, uh, it's a David Lawrence the K through eight school in the North Miami, Florida. Now they're working with a number of universities nearby, but uh, these are again young students and. Uh, uh, their leader, uh, John Escobar, uh, says that they they uh, they now have a new swagger because they're part of that secret satellite building society. You know that's happening in their school, and they're getting a lot of press. They're getting uh, you know it, it's a it's a, a huge boost, you know, and a a new reason to go to school you know, and into study science because you're actively involved in building something that's going to space and it's going to do something for you. So uh, you know it's going to do work on orbit. That's that's like I said, that's a that's a fantastic opportunity that I wish I had had in, in school. Here's another email for you from Jerome, mm -hmm. in Syracuse, New York, and he says, going back to the Google Lunar X Prize discussion from the earlier segment, at what point do you apply for an AST launch license because you have to allow enough time to get it and to make your launch if you're going to win the Google Lunar X Prize, which again is the end of 2015. So when, in terms of timing, well, would you have to be ready to apply for an AST launch license? Standard launch license requires six months, so that there's a minimum of six months. Minimum. Does Do they actually get it done in six months? Yes. Mm -hmm. They have to give you some sort of an outcome uh, at, that, at that time. Now, when we got our first, uh, our first launch license, it went the full... Uh, right down to the last day of that, that time period. But what we understand is it's now been streamlined, uh, so hopefully it'll be a, you know, a, a quicker outcome. And if you're doing the same rocket, uh, we, we have talked with them uh, about uh, you know, uh, doing launches at different locations with the same rocket. They'll know the vehicle. You know, and, and in fact, we're, we're inviting them out to various uh, milestone events of the development of, uh, of the uh, N7 here. So that they'll know how we work, how we, uh, you know, and how the how the technology performs you know, firsthand, not just from a you know, a report. Uh, and and we we hope that that will uh, again speed the uh, launch license. In terms of a lunar launch, I don't know exactly how long uh, you know that whole process will take. What what are the other layers that are involved in that? But the actual rocket launch itself, I believe, is still under that same uh, uh, you know the same Time frame uh, in terms of so if you uh, if you months. if you really wanted to cut this close, then by June of 2015, you would need to have your launch yeah. license. And of course, you'd have no margins in. Right. We, we would do it a year in advance just to be sure. Yeah. Um, we would expect to have already launched uh, the the the, the, uh, the smaller vehicles uh, on orbital missions, now, and and with those with that success, it would it would be just a Minor change to, to uh, step up to the lunar, since the an, lunar uh, satisfying the lunar launch regulations. Since an environmental impact is required, how do you get one for launching in the Pacific Ocean? Well, we already have one. Uh, we had one uh, for the first uh, the first um, uh, launch license we had uh, had an EPA component to it. And, uh, but you, you think about it. You know, look at the look at the length of time. That rocket is operating in or anywhere near the ocean. You know, it's a matter of seconds. Right. And then you look at, say, a giant oil tanker coming through, you know, flying its way across the ocean. What kind of environmental impact does that have, you know, opposed to like an event that lasts a couple of seconds? Well, <clears throat> uh, I, I would think there's probably more risk, uh, even in an accident, if the rocket blew up. You know, I guess most of the components are going to sink to the bottom of the ocean, yeah. and they become reefs. <laughs> and uh, the, the nitric acid is uh, soluble in water, so yeah. it would just be diluted if there were any release of nitric acid. And it's well, yeah, I'm, I, it, I can't imagine it's carrying enough fuel on board to have any kind of a concentration. Like a drop in the... In the a drop in the ocean, so to speak. Ocean, yeah. <laughs> the ocean, <laughs> and, of course, Sea Launch has blown a couple of them up yeah. over there, So, yeah. um, and, but I'm sure they have... Uh, a standing EIR that, that they've had for years. Yeah, and, you know, actually it's, um, there's more involved now in the, uh, in the licensing procedure than there was when we got our license, but the same, the same, basic same components are there. 
you know, you, you, will, you, can't, you can't perform recklessly, obviously. And, and you, also, you know, doing it from a remote area in the ocean, there are no uh, extensive uh, installations nearby that can be damaged that, that if you're launching from a spaceport, there's a lot more, there are a lot more... Uh, yeah, your debris field is, is mostly water, I would imagine. And we get a lower insurance rate there, too, because there's no, uh, well, first, no population centers, so a you know, probable loss is uh, in terms of uh, uh, death as a, in the general population, very, very low. We're probably the only ones in danger out there, at, you know, the ones on the boat. And the, um, it's just... Uh, they like the idea that we're using a remote location to do uh, the initial tests on the, on a uh, on a new rocket on a new launch vehicle. So I, I guess you make sure there's no Carnival Cruise Line down the end of your launch, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. uh, you never know that people might have wanted that sort of thing on that last. <laughs> um, I, I I don't know, but um, um, anyway, what does it cost to get a launch license? It's no cost. It's a free. It's a free license. So you, you don't, don't pay it. You don't it's on your on, on yeah. the person we're applying for the license, um, and, but not nothing in terms of what. There's no, no, no fees involved yeah, at it's, all. Uh, you know, obviously there's analysis to be done, and all of the the things that we've done within the company to uh, you know to get this done. I mean, you'd, you, know, you incur company costs to do it, but yes. there's no no it, actual it, launch <laughs> license fee as such. Okay. And, and actually, the, the the our experience with the AST has been very very positive. They, uh, they want to see the commercial sector succeed, and they've been very helpful. And, um, you know, it, it's, um, I, I have no problems working with them. So I'm actually looking forward to, uh, to the completion of our, well, our, our, um, our orbital launch applications. We, we're waiting to get some data from the flight tests of the, uh, these low-altitude flights to include in that package. But, um, you know, I, I I like the people who work there, and I like how they work. It's, it's been we, a we've all, we've just completed a, an analysis of our launch vehicle, so we know that uh, it, it, it will perform as as as, uh, as required for an orbital launch. Um, I have another hard question for mm -hmm. you. Okay, so this is Wendy is in Houston, Texas, and she says, David, I'm at work, so I am using email. I hope you'll ask this question. I know that it's a little hard. But here, here goes. Uh, it's pretty well known within the space advocacy, space enthusiast market, that inner orbital seems to be outside the margins. In fact, I have been to New Space and other conferences, and they seem to not be part of the mix or the group of the more traditionals like Excor, Blue, Virgin, and others. I'm wondering how that happened why you are regarded in a way that is very different from, say, Virgin or Excor or Armadillo or Maston, and what you do about it. Also, does the AST regard you any different from the others when you talk to them, when you work with them on your products? Are you given the same accord and respect or sort of dismissed as a lunatic fringe? <laughs> That's interesting. Well, first, first of all, let's say that <laughs> that what we, we the conferences we go to are the the real satellite conferences. Where yeah, I see the, you at SmallSat all the time. Right. And, and and I never see those people there. We we go to all the CubeSat conferences. Uh, they won't go. All Sat conferences. And I never see those people. Yeah, so the, I could ask that same question. The, the, you know the the NRO ride share, the NASA conferences, and, and you know uh, those are fan basically. You know, not to not to be cruel, but they're basically fanboy kind of events. The the ones that, that you're mentioning. The ones and, that Wendy mentioned. Yeah, and you know, and and Wendy, you know, uh, you know, we don't need to marry our competitors, so they don't have to like us. Uh, and I, I think it's largely it largely stems from that original, you know, uh, resentment that we're doing a, oh, very sexy orbital program here, and the other programs are suborbital. And what can I say? We've been dedicated to orbital missions from day one. It's in our name. We went. Orbital and inter interplanetary missions, and you know, I'm sorry, we're just not interested in, in running that whole suborbital thing as our main focus. So, uh, you know, maybe that's where it comes from. Uh, and and uh, well, we're we're more interested in the real space. Yeah, we want real <laughs> real space to... flights, real space uh, uh, commerce, and um, you know, I I don't know. As yeah. far as the FAA, they they, they we we uh, we have 
been to Washington several times, have, have uh, had meetings with them. They've been at our to our place. They visit here. We visit there. We we're in personal. We were in yeah. direct contact with uh, with them on a regular basis. So there's no. Yeah. They don't treat us. I don't know how they treat, you know, the the the, other, the ones she's talking about. But they they treat us. Like, like it's, they don't, there's nothing weird going on with us in the FAA that I know of. And also, why would they give us permits and licenses if they, uh, you know, there, there's a large movement to place us on that uh, lunatic fringe, as Wendy mentioned. And, you know, just the other day, you know, we had a, uh, you know, we, we are constantly left out of articles or, or promotional videos or things of that nature. It doesn't matter to us. We continue with our work, and, and as I've always said, well, let the hardware speak for itself. And uh, you know, I don't, I don't, uh, we don't need to be liked by, by, you know, well, those people. Uh, uh, you know, listeners, just um, for the record, I um, I do go to Small Sat every year, and and usually Dr. Juris is there too, and uh, I don't go to the Cube Sat thing ahead of Small Sat, but I do run into. Uh, Rand and Rod at almost every small sat, and uh, I know they're there at the CubeSat thing. I have met you guys and seen you at old Space Frontier Foundation conferences That's when they the were past. done in That's L.A. It used, to be, it used to be friendly and congenial, and now it's become uh, I haven't seen you at one in a long thing. I don't know what it is. You know? Well, there, it's, you know, under, under different management, mm -hmm. and it has a different focus, and I really miss those old uh, so I. conferences at the Sheraton in uh, near LAX. This yeah, is those, usually those where they were fun. Them. You know, and we all we all used to participate, and uh, nobody had to uh, try to damn somebody because maybe they didn't have as wonderful a program as we have. Uh, so it's it's, it's more it's, like a popularity contest. It's, it is a popularity. Yeah. It's and like, as I said, it's a treehouse mentality. You know, we have our own little club here, and you're not allowed. And who knows what it is? Who knows if it's because there's a female involved? Who knows if it's a uh, 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 because we have a, just a completely different take? You know, we, we have different propellants. We have a different uh, philosophy. Uh, you know, everything's different. But, you know, to make progress, you just, you know, you've know, you got to think different, right? <laughs> so it's, um, and, and our system is different. And... That's why, you know, in, in, in order to make that, that huge, much sought after, you know, dramatic, game changing breakthrough in cost to access space, uh, you know, you've got to do it differently. You can't do the same old thing. In, you know, I, I've interviewed George Nell of, of AST many, many times, and I asked him off air about uh, a couple of companies. There's one in particular in Denver, and I, I'm not going to mm -hmm. mention the name. Uh, that sends out newsletters about their their Mars trips and flying oh, saucers. I, I don't understand what that is. Yeah, I. I you know I, who I'm talking about. Yeah, I do. And I, do. I, I mean, I love getting their their emails and stuff. And uh, he's always saying he's got an FAA license. Yeah, and, uh, and, and what I, is that? Uh, is that I don't know, but but <laughs> George is the most polite, uh -huh. courteous guy you will ever talk to and ever meet. And and he says we have talked to him and. Uh, you know he's he's just he brings dignity to the position, uh -huh. and I have never heard him say lunatic fringe or anything yep. uh, despairing about anybody yep. or any company uh, in the industry. Mm -hmm. Even if he has a big smile on his face when I ask him in person about the Denver operation, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, actually, um, I, you ought to get on that email list. I mean, their stuff is is oh, I've seen it. Yeah, very it, entertaining. It is. It really is. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I just sometimes I think if I'm ever in that area, maybe I'll stop by and see the famed spacecraft. But uh, you that's know, a, that's the one with the anti-gravity. Uh, it's a number of. Things. Oh, another one. Yeah. Well, he, yeah, well, he has a flying saucer that yeah, goes to and from Mars all the time. Uh, they, well, you know, I can't. All I can say is the guy's enthusiastic, right? Oh yeah, yeah. he's um, he's he's wonderful. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, he, he's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, how is uh, life uh, at Mojave? Because you're in there with all the, the big boys, with all the press and all mm -hmm. the, all the everything. So um, and and you're, uh, you know, saying smaller potatoes. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but, uh, you know, the the cameras like to focus on Virgin and Scaled and and X Core and and Maston. So do you feel competitive? Do you feel like there's well, competition uh, breathing down your necks? We don't. It's just kind of like uh, they ignore us. Yeah, and and that's fine. You know, we we, <laughs> we don't need it. We don't need the, that publicity because we get our own. We get our 
constantly getting sales from around the world. So if it's a, if it's a private club, then uh, then it's a private club. You know, we're 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 just. Uh, we're just different anyway. You might Our, notice also yeah. that there is a Mojave video, uh, airport video, and, and we are not in, in the video. Yeah, that's a cute one. They, they, they talk about, you know, there's several people that are, we're not the only ones not in it, but they, they on purpose will not include us. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a thing, you know. <laughs> and, and that's really a, I think it's odd that, that groups that are supposed to be promoting a commercial space flight, you know, like the Space Frontier Foundation or, or uh, any of the, the many bloggers that are out there, uh, you know, we'll not we'll not report on our uh, on our progress. I don't know if it's because we've been around so long and we've been working so long that it uh, you know to them it's uh, oh you know who are those people you know I, I don't know what the attitude is, but at any rate it's um, it's it's a strange phenomenon when the when the supposed promoters of commercial space either try to make you an unperson. You know, which I see happening quite a bit, or just just simply don't include it. You would think that would enhance any organization if this, particularly when there's an orbital program, uh, you know, essentially in the backyard. You know, that's um, it, it comes back to that strange new push for suborbital experimentation. I really wonder how many of those those uh, uh, you know those flights that I think it's a, it's a NASA program that they're they're actually trying to fill, or actually getting any, if they're getting any business, because you could basically do the same work in a Cessna. You know, I mean, it's just bizarre. And um, there may be two, I think, two programs that will eventually be translatable to orbital uh, activities, but not many. So um, uh, I find it odd. Uh, ben is in San Diego by email. And he says you're mentioning suborbital programs transferable to orbital. Uh, tell me how that works. The amount of energy to go suborbital is significantly less than going orbital. How can you transfer a suborbital vehicle into an orbital vehicle? Even the heat dissipation is magnitudes different. It would seem to me that it would be far easier to have an orbital vehicle and then scale it back to suborbital rather than going the other direction. Well, that is true. That is uh, absolutely true. But I would uh, say the only way you could make a, a suborbital vehicle orbital would be to, to add a, another stage somehow, which I see that they are proposing a, a, some kind of a piggyback stage on their rocket planes. And that, that, that's the only way that could be done. But he's right. It, it should be, it'd be it's a lot easier to scale back, go back the other way. So it would be easier for you guys to go suborbital after you, you have your Neptune orbital vehicle, then for uh, x or Virgin to ramp up, uh, especially with Virgin's hybrid engine, to go orbital. Oh, far yeah, easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. way, way easier. In fact, the upper stage, is, like I mentioned earlier, is a suborbital, is a, is a sounding rocket, the third stage. Well, let's see who goes or orbital first. You know, let that, let's see how that happens. Well, right. so, so far yeah. you've got one player, and that's uh, SpaceX. Yes, and that's uh, that's fantastic. That they, and and I don't know if you remember, but in the beginning they they suffered the same type of. Uh, I remember uh, the Falcon yeah. One launches. Yeah, yeah, yeah they, everybody they, they does. They suffered also the. You know, it was a very negative, uh, uh, mostly from the primes. It actually reminds me of just the other day I saw on uh, CNN. It was it looked like uh, prime contractor propaganda, and uh, they were talking about how the rocket business is booming, and uh, so they went into I think it was. Uh, it was one of the major primes, you know, gigantic facilities. And instead of just talking about the, uh, you know, the greatness of, um, you know, the whole space industry in general and how this rocket business is booming, they said that, that the interview with the, uh, the corporate head there, uh, the sound bite they used was, those small companies will just fade away. <laughs> I'm thinking, wow, that, that's a weird thing. You know, why would you want to stick that kind of a thought in the public mind when, you know, uh, the companies involved in this kind of work uh, are are really trying to bring those costs down and make it make it better for the general public, not just keep that old kind of launch cartel uh, price list in in force. You know, it's um, it was a strange sort of a report. Yeah, and and I think for people who have followed the development of SpaceX and and their Falcon One program and all of this, 
uh, you have to know that this is pretty damn hard and, and pretty that. costly. Even if SpaceX is successful in bringing the cost way down, uh, this isn't um, you know cheap penny ante uh, cash. This this is really, um, as Elon says, you know, don't believe anything I said years ago. This is really hard. It is rocket science. Yeah, that, that's something I will definitely agree with. Um, yeah, and uh, by the way, they have a launch uh, a week from today. Yes, yes, we're so, interested in um, seeing how that goes, and that's that's great. You know, I'm, I'm uh, and I think it's remarkable that uh, that they've had the the early success that they have had with the launch vehicle. It's very, uh, you know, very few um, uh, you know negative uh, experiences. Uh, it's remarkable. It really, really is. And I think some of the some of the primes are, you know, they're upset. They're, they're, and somebody once said, you know, once you start messing with a rice bowl, you know, of a, of a, of a particular group of people, then, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's well, you're going to generate enemies. Basically. Yeah, well, you can see how upset, because rem remember when they did those block buys for uh, ULA, for the military, and, and space that subjected, and they finally got a, a toe in the door to get a few of the block buys going to the to the Falcon launcher. But, you know, this has been the protected industry mm, of, of, of the of the chosen companies. And, uh -huh. and damn you, new, new guys coming in to intrude, especially if you can do it cheaper than what mm -hmm. we can do. Yep. Uh, b because that's, I, I, we all, I think we all understand that. And I think that SpaceX has, has addressed all of that really well. And I certainly wish for them a continued line of I success do too. for I, what I they're doing. I think it helps, it helps everyone it involved. It helps everyone. And uh, that, you know, the constant... Uh, Bickering that goes on, or or the other things that you know in the in the um, you know I said it's like a nail salon, you know. I mean, it's, everybody is just you know at each other's throats. Um, it's, but we, it's we, ridiculous. We, we are in competition with SpaceX, but we we actually we we are absolutely sure we will beat them with, with the price mm -hmm. uh, eventually in terms of launch cost per pound. But there's always business kilogram. too, and there's business but, for everyone. Well, but they have a different market they with do. with going yeah. to uh, the station and then the Falcon Heavy and stuff like that. I mean, they're they're in a different market niche than what... Well, currently, what we, let's say they're in a different yeah. market. Our, you know, we do have, like I said, we have, we have interplanetary goals, and uh, our, our first two orbital flights are, are really the proof of the pudding here. These, this, is, this, this, is, this, is, this is it, basically. We are, uh, we are at the point, we've evolved to this point, and the vehicle system has evolved to the point where we're ready for this flight test system and uh, uh, series to begin. And uh, that's what we've worked for our entire lives. Basically. And we have a super CPM on the drawing board yep. as well for a, a next generation after we go through the, uh, this initial series of uh, missions. Here, here's another question. It may be the, uh, the last one for the day, mm -hmm. uh, given our time. But this is Tim is in Seattle. And Tim says, everything I've heard about hypergolic fuel is really dangerous. I remember the Titan ICBM and the difficulties in fueling with hypergolics, the uniforms, the costumes that people had to wear, all of that. Have you thought about doing a hybrid rocket motor, which apparently is a lot easier and a lot safer? Now, people have first, died. First of all, I will say about the, the hybrid rocket yeah. engines is they're not scalable. That's being shown uh, right, right at this point in some of the development that's going on. Why is it not scalable? Uh, there's, I, I, I don't know. I can't, I can't get into the details of it, but when, when people build really large hybrids, they, they start having problems with combustion instabilities, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a technical issue. At, at any rate, it's But it, in any it, case, it, we'll yeah. go beyond that. Uh, yeah. As far as hypergolics go, um, Actually, the types of hypergolics we use, so the only the only fuel that we use that is uh, that has a corrosive nature is the nitric acid. Our other fuel is uh, carbentine, which is everybody uses a, it as a paint thinner. So it's not like the kinds of propellants that were used in the Titan. Uh, they're they're relatively safe and uh, um, very 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 inexpensive and. Uh, we we do use protective clothing so that we don't inhale the fumes. But we when we do the transfer from the fill tanks to the to the uh, rocket propellant tanks, we uh, to the to the nitric tank. It, it the uh, nitric never comes in contact with the air. It's all pressure fed from one tank to another through a line. And you have safety, you know, just in case something there's a leak or. or but but, it, but I should you know stress that these aren't are not the same as the types of. Uh, it's not like uh, UDMH or 
monomethylhydrazine or, or, or N2O4 or any of those types Which are of all, These are all fantastic propellants, yeah. but you have to respect them. Like you have to respect every rocket propellant. And, but even uh, liquid oxygen, uh, yeah. I mean, when they put the liquid oxygen on the, down in Long Beach when they fill the tanks on the... On the launch platform, they have to evacuate the area because there's so much oxygen in That's the air. That's for sea launch, yeah. And for sea launch, that that it, it becomes a, it could, could become an issue in terms of, you know, an explosion or whatever because of the high concentration of oxygen. So, with any kind of propellant, there you you have to be very cautious. In and how everyone you seems to think that nitrous oxide is some kind of a you know, godsend in terms of safety. Well, it's not. Three people died here in Mojave. People were injured using that so-called safe. Uh, propellant. Uh, yeah, you rap, cannot, rap, rapid decomposition yeah, is yeah. an issue with nitrous oxide, that's, especially in very large quantities, and that, that's been shown to be uh, yeah. uh, an issue through the years, and I think some people are now realizing that, and so there's mm. and there, there's a lot of stuff out there on the, on the Internet now from some, some experts on the hybrids, if anybody wants to see what the, the real story of, of scaling up hybrids is, do a little search on that, and you'll see there's some interesting uh, research that's been done and we basically avoided hybrids. The definition of a hybrid is the, the, the worst, uh, the worst uh, characteristics of a solid and of a liquid uh, rocket. So, you know, there, there are many things that, uh, that don't, don't uh, work for us. And don't consider, I mean, the, the caller or the person who sent that question, The email, Tim. Yeah, should never, ever consider any rocket propellant safe because they aren't. They yeah. aren't. You have to you have to respect that and uh, and also hybrids you have you know. to you have to cast the the, the uh, solid uh, grain uh, for a specific application and every time you change your burn time or or whatever or, or any other characteristic of the the uh, of the uh, the mission you you have to you have to design and cast a, a new uh, grain and the architecture of that grain is really uh, sensitive to uh, it has to be done exactly in the right right way or you're going to have to have some kind of issue in terms of mostly combustion instabilities and grains melting during the test and collapsing in on themselves and there's all kinds of problems. They're basically too much work in the production of those uh, those types of um, engines and uh, we've looked at every type of engine in our in our whole propulsion career here which has spanned you know more than a decade uh, and and we've used every type of propellant you can use we've made every type of rocket engine you can think of and uh, our, our, I will say our, that, that, our focus I, is, is liquid. It can always comes back to bipropellant liquid rocket. I will say the hybrids are fine for small, mm -hmm. for very small uh, engines. The hybrid hybrid engines are fine for these little little, you know, couple of hundred pound thrust. And you're pressure fed, right? What's that? Yeah, we're all pre yeah, pressure. You're pressure fed. fed. You're not using a turbo pump. No. No turbo pumps. Uh, we're, we're relying on on our lightweight tank designs. We have that instead of relying on a uh, turbo pump. For, for reducing the weight of the rocket, so we, we have composite tanks, plastic and composite tanks, that are very extremely lightweight. So do, you, do you make them, or do you buy them from Microcosm or one of the other? No, companies? no, we make them in house. Okay. We develop the whole the whole tank technology in house. So a lot of this work that we've been doing is prototyping for this, you know, for the really the the advent of this this new vehicle, and uh, again we we follow those. Those, uh, I guess the edicts of uh, you know, like John London with his, uh, uh, you know, Leo on the cheap, right? That's a great cost book. Design uh, philosophy and all those things that will give us an actual low cost launch vehicle and one that's easy to mass produce. So that's what we've been working towards like, since day one, and now it's come to fruition. Um, when should we look for your next test or something? I know you don't want to give out actual dates, but. 30 days, six months, nine months, something uh, general? It'll, it'll be coming up in a, in, in a few weeks. That's, that's an engine test we'll be yeah. doing. And, and then, then once we do finish that test, then we're going to put the engine on the rocket that we have already built and then uh, take it out to uh, the test site in north of here and launch it. And, and <clears throat> to what altitude do you want to get that rocket to? Well, this one's, this one's designed, uh, we're testing uh, a lot of systems. So it's not designed to go to a lot high altitude. It's only going to around 30,000 feet. But it's this, it's a full scale CPM, uh, with, but with a tanks that don't hold a, a full load of propellant. We had to do that on purpose, otherwise the, the thing would go hundreds of miles in uh, you know altitude. So, so we just said we have smaller tanks on this on this vehicle, and it's, we're using it to test a lot of the systems. 
But it's a 38-foot tall rocket. It's uh, two feet in diameter, and it, uh, it is the exact size and, uh, and aerodynamically the same as uh, every uh, one of the, the basic building blocks that will be used on the, on the, uh, the Neptune 7. So it's one, one portion of the Neptune 7. And then 7. after that, we're, we're, we will be doing a full-scale uh, common propulsion module with a full load of propellant. And uh, we're going to do a full-duration full burn on that on the ground at the test site. And then after that, we're going to be launching, and with that, that will, we will use to test everything from uh, from the from the engine performance in flight to uh, to our guidance system. Well, we will certainly be keeping our our eyes open and following uh, your results, and and uh, we we certainly wish you great success with it, and keep us posted on on things. And um, you know, when you're ready and and you have updates, we'll do it again. Great. Okay, well, great. Thank you, David. Thanks so much. Uh, any closing comments you have? Anything you want to leave with the listeners before we sign off? Just that there's nothing more exciting than doing this kind of work. And, and anybody uh, has even the, you know, the remotest uh, leanings in this area should, should follow, follow them, follow that dream. And it's, it's, the payoff is, is, is unimaginably great. Also, you have a chance to uh, build and have a satellite launch. So, so contact us if you yep. have the skills and you want to build a actually build a satellite yeah your own personal satellite is within reach okay um we'll stay in touch and uh i look forward to seeing you down the road and again uh great luck with your upcoming uh test and demo flights and uh everyone on the space show wishes you great success thank you david thank, thank you guys for joining us and listeners that's it for today friday uh, Dr. Doug Plata, who many of you know as a frequent caller to the space show, is on Sunday. Uh, this is a guy who comes up with uh, really cool ideas for space advocacy, and then what he does is he puts them into action, and we're going to talk about how he actually does that. Thanks to the Mill Irons and Inner Orbital System. Everybody have a great weekend, a safe weekend. Goodbye from the space show. <laughs>